Once again I was on my way to work in Hillsburg and after the last experience was departing a half hour earlier at 4.25 a.m. All of the alien abduction stuff was taking up such a big part of my life that I began working my schedule around it. Back then I wasn't understanding about the alien abduction phenomena that was happening to him so that's probably why Michael stopped telling me about the things going on. He was leaving earlier and earlier just to get to work and I seriously began to wonder why. Who knows? From my perspective, he could have had something going on to side, like maybe another woman. That's what most wives might think, but it didn't make any sense at all at that time of morning. I told him that I'd get more sleep if I were him, but he insisted on departing an hour and 35 minutes early for a 40 minute drive. It's no wonder a woman would wonder what her husband was up to. I was heading north on the 101 freeway listening to the band Toto on cassette tape. After passing the last Santa Rosa exit, I entered the Forgotten Land, a part of the freeway between Santa Rosa and Hillsburg without street lights, cars, or people. Back then, this stretch of the road was very secluded, and if you broke down, it'd be a long walk for help. I was a few miles from my exit when I glanced to the right through the passenger window and saw what appeared to be a very bright halogen headlight coming out of the dark field heading straight for me. I wasn't sure what it was and thought, well, maybe it was a motorcycle or somebody four-wheeling in the field, except it was extremely early and dark and it didn't make any sense. It was moving way too fast, too. It was very low to the ground and cruising like a jet as it headed directly for the highway. It pulled in a little ways behind me and I watched in my rear view mirror as it soared up right on me. I waited for it to pass, but it did Instead, it remained directly behind me. I began freaking because it was right on me, tailgating, just a few feet to the rear of my car. I seriously thought it was going to hit me, so I screamed out the window, Back off, you idiot! I was about two miles or so from my exit as it positioned itself even closer to the vehicle. I was terrified that it was going to run me off the road. I really didn't have a clue as to who or what it was or what they wanted, so I stepped on the gas trying to get away. It was no use as the faster I went, the faster it went, keeping up with me staying right on my tail. In my rear view mirror, the vehicle resembled a truck and its lights were so bright they were actually blinding me from behind, making it difficult to see where I was going. Suddenly my car lifted off the road, then began moving to the right all on its own. I tried steering left, but I couldn't. At that moment, I thought possibly that my steering linkage broke from racing so fast, trying to get away from whatever it was, and the harder I turned left, the more the car went right. I knew I was going to crash, so I totally freaked, thinking the car is going to flip over at the side of the road, and that'd be it. Without doing a thing, my vehicle began slowing down. The stereo, which was still playing the Toto tape, immediately stopped. Everything went dead. The engine died like it was being killed. The headlights and dash lights went out, the cassette turned off, and everything went completely dead. The vehicle came to a complete stop and was hovering just a few feet above the road. It began slowly moving to the right through the air and didn't stop until it was out in the field. The lights behind me were so bright I couldn't see much of anything. Finally it felt like I hit something as the vehicle stopped moving towards the field. There were loud noises coming from the rear from behind which sounded very mechanical almost like winches. I heard what sounded like a diesel engine along with winching, high-pitched sound. My car was violently jerking back and forth, then finally dropped to the ground. I remembered thinking whoever it was messed up my car and caused me an expensive repair bill. Squinting while examining the light in my driver mirror, I became angered at whoever or whatever was messing with me in my vehicle. With the window still open, I yelled, Hey, you idiot, now you've done it. You've wrecked my car. When I heard no reply, my anger quickly turned to fear as I became scared to death. 
I was absolutely terrified to even step out of the vehicle because seriously didn't know what was going on. After all, what just happened was seriously out of the ordinary and I didn't have a clue what was next. Glancing back into the side mirror, I spotted four silhouettes of beings as they approached my vehicle. They didn't look much like people at all and their shadowed appearances nearing the driver door frightened me to death. Very quickly, I rolled up the window and locked the door. I tried placing the car in park and starting my engine, but it was useless as the shift lever was locked into drive and wouldn't move. Everything in the vehicle was still deader than doornails too. Suddenly flashbacks of previous abductions began replaying in my head as I thought, oh great, here we go again. Quickly jumping over the bench seat into the back, I turned myself into a ball and tried hiding on the floor. I don't know why I did this because whatever they were knew I was in the car anyway. Seriously, I think I did it because it seemed like the only available option. A feeling of extreme tiredness ex and exhaustion fell about me. I glanced up from the floorboard through the rear passenger window and that's when I saw what was after me. There were four alien faces staring at me through the glass as I lay on the floor. One of them was taller than the others with a fleshy human appearance. He was dressed in black and wearing a black hat, very much like one a western gunfighter would wear. The other three were short, little gray beings with large black eyes, large bald craniums, and were also dressed in black. I knew they were short as their heads just reached high enough to see through the side and back windows. The tall one with the hat raised his hand, then light began flashing off it as the car completely filled with a bright white light. Almost instantly, I felt myself being lifted into the air and floating inside the car as I began completely going unconscious. The last thing I remember was the intense bright light surrounding me as it seemed to become part of me. My body grew extremely warm, very much like hot flashes, right before I completely went out. I came to and was still very groggy, just like one would feel after surgery. It didn't take but a few moments for me to totally come around, and that's when I noticed I was on the floor of a very brightly lit white room. At this point, I became totally awake and aware of everything happening. I was completely nude, and whatever happened to my clothes was a mystery. It felt as if the room were some sort of waiting or holding room by the way it was set up. There was a white bench seat in front of me that ran the entire length of the wall. Picking myself up from the floor and further examining the room, I noticed there were no doors or windows, just bright white walls, ceiling and floor. The entire area was completely exempt of all furnishings other than the one lone bench along the wall. Although the room was brightly lit, there weren't any visible signs of fixtures or light sources, but instead was rather filled with light coming from an unknown source. Oddly enough, I wanted out, but obviously without doors or windows, it was impossible. So the thought of escape fled my mind as I began mentally relaxing. I slowly turned, then headed straight for the bench because I wanted to sit. I felt uh, to be under some sort of influence, making me accepting the fact that I was there. My mental state changed, making me no longer care where I actually was. My mind was alert, so I became curious as to why I was actually there. I figured I would eventually find out, so I decided to close my eyes and rest in the silence and stillness. With my eyes closed, I noticed I heard nothing. Not a hum from lights, not a sound from appliances, and no noises from other rooms. It was a complete eerie silence. While relaxing, I suddenly felt a strange presence just like I did as a child in the atrium, so I opened my eyes. I didn't say a word, and I just stared in amazement. I was examining three alien beings who were also examining me. The alien in the middle was different than the other two, and was definitely more humanoid, as its skin was fleshy, like ours. It was extremely tall, probably somewhere around seven to eight feet, and towered over the two shorter grays. 
the two greys appeared to have a flesh like dolphins, almost wet look appearance, really shiny and uh, just glossy. All three of the aliens had a slender bodies, two arms, two hands, four fingers each hand, two legs, two feet, four toes each foot. It was the weirdest feeling as somehow I already knew how to communicate with them, so I began thinking what I wanted to say. What's going on? Why am I here? Where are my clothes? Please try relaxing and let us explain as we waited a very long time to have this talk with you. In your world, it is your custom to wear clothing, so we do so when visiting. However, in our world, we have no such custom, so clothing is not necessary. Your clothes will be returned to you when we are finished. We visited you many times throughout your life, but you were not ready for our subject matter during those visits. The time has come and you are now ready for these communications. I don't understand. What do you need to tell me and why? We know you do not understand and we want to help you so you can fully understand the meaning behind all of our visits. Do you remember during one of our visits being introduced to a young baby? Yes, actually I do. I remember one of those little blue beans holding a baby. Why is that significant to me? He was your great, great uncle and was never given a chance to be born as he was killed before birth at his father's hand, just as you were almost killed by your father in that barn stall after your mother left. How did you know my dad did that to me? Something stopped him too. Were you there? Yes, we've been there with you since you were conceived as we told you when you were just a young child. We are your parents. You are part your mother, Helene, part your father, William, and part us. We've been doing this for a very long time. You and others like you are part of us and walk on your residing planet with us in you. We created you to be what you were intended to be. I've always wondered what those beings meant by telling me they were my parents. It confused me. How and why are you doing this? Your kind is very flawed, so we continually design you into what we want you to be. You have part of us in you, and you reproduce with others of your species, and we carry on through you. We care about what happens to you as we have goals for you, which have been pre-selected before your conception. You've been designed to be what you are, and so have many others like you. So it was you who threw my dad across that stall when he was strangling me and trying to kill me? You've been watching out for me? Yes, we did not want him to harm you, so after you left the barn, we took him and taught him never to lay a hand on you again. And he didn't. He never touched me again after you got through with him. I asked him what happened when I left, and he couldn't tell me. He said he didn't know. That is because after we instilled the beliefs of him never laying a hand on you, we removed of us. I guess I owe you thanks. So is that what you wanted to tell me? It is part of what we want you to know. Another part is we need you to understand many things that will happen in your world, which is actually our world. We allow your people to exist as when you walk the face 
of this planet. We walk with you. You are the hosts which we keep our existence alive and your kind is part of our reproduction system. You have a family heritage which predates further than you can imagine. Your grandmother was correct in telling you that where you come from, your father would be put to death for laying his hands on you. You do come from kings and queens and have vanished from the royal line by them, not us. You, your brothers and sister, are all part of this royal family and were unfairly removed simply because of your great, great grandmother's financial status. She was born and a maid to the family, as your grandmother told you. When the prince made her pregnant, he and the family banished her instead of making an honest woman of her. That same prince married a princess and had another affair which produced another child like your great-great-grandmother did. This time, instead of turning her away, he killed her. The unborn child, which was also our child, then committed suicide. The child which was murdered in the womb was and still is your great-great-uncle, and this is why you were introduced to him. We stopped your father from killing you as we did not want history repeating itself. Your uncle was conceived for a purpose and was smothered out before he could do what he was intended to do. You are going to walk in his footsteps and complete the task he was meant to do. You are the earthly persona of his extinguished being and will conclude what he was never able to finish. His grandparents have great remorse for what they've done and wish it never happened the way it did. If they would have allowed their son, the prince, to marry out of love instead of status, your great-great-grandmother and him would have married. Oh my god, so grandma was right and we actually did come from royalty? Not just royalty, but the Holy Roman Empire. The prince, who was your great-great-grandfather, was the son of the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in a country you call Austria. He was a great ruler and at one point his empire was poised to take place of the Catholic Church. It was meant to happen but it never did because his arrogance had the child who was going to carry that torch killed at his own father's hands. His quest was halted by a very unnecessary event leading to his death, leaving no more sons from that dynasty. You and your family are the lost sheep from the Holy Family, and we have ordained you to follow through. You will follow through, and you will do the work of our Father, which is your Father, whom you call God. He has chosen you to continue in the footsteps, and you will receive support from us getting these words out there. The world will make attempts to shut you out. However, we won't let your candle burn out until we feel you completed the task you were designed for. Your earthly father was set in place to take you out, so we had no choice but to stop him. These are the mysteries you did not know. You have a job to do, and you are going to do it. Wow, that's incredible. I do have a question. When I was a teenager, my brother and I were in the mountains and saw a huge orange sphere behind the trees. I'm guessing it was you, but my brother told me what he saw was God. 
I want to ask, are you guys God? No, we are not the God you speak of as he is much higher and grander than us. We have our hierarchy as you have yours, and the God you speak of is way above us. We are what your people call angels. God completely controls us as we are under his power. The little blue beings are what your people call cherubim. The short gray beings you see before you are what your people call angels. The taller one which you see is called by your people archangels. Okay, if you guys are angels, then who is Satan? Satan is an earthly term, but what that term refers to is a being like the tall one before you. The one you call Satan was an archangel who tried to take control away from his creator. He organized one third of the gray beings which you are looking at called angels and started a war against the creator of all. Because of his revolt, he was banished to this planet along with the graves who followed him in your world refers to them as fallen angels. They come and go from this planetary world causing discord, mayhem, destruction, and in the process capture the people of this world and do terrible things to them. These fallen angels look just like us in every way. You will be able to tell the difference in them because they will not build up but tear down. They will not help but hinder. They will not save you from danger but push you into it. Be on your guard against them. When we return to live among the ones left here on this planet, they will be sent to and walk into a dead and frozen zone of the universal expanse. We must move on as there is still more we need to tell you. So what more do you need to tell me? It seems like you covered a whole bunch of stuff. The people of this world are failing Instead of protecting it, they are tearing it down. They allow factories, automobiles, trucks, trains, aircraft, equipment, refineries to pollute a world which does not belong to them all for financial gains. We've offered help, but instead of using our help and knowledge for the better of mankind, they've used it to tear down and line their pockets with monetary quests. They were given a device you call the Ark of the Covenant, which was given as a gift to help clean up your world. It was intended to heal the people and to keep your environment clean. Instead of using this gift to help mankind, they used it to fight wars and to kill their fellow man. They actually took a device from us that was intended to help and turned it into a weapon to destroy mankind. They misused this gift like a child would a toy. And when a child misuses a toy, often it is taken away from him much like our gift was from mankind. That art we took back and it will never be found by mankind again. Every time we give a gift, maybe it be knowledge or like the art, it is misused by certain individuals within mankind. We give knowledge and they use this knowledge to build more weapons to kill more men. We've given chances and we aren't going to continue giving them as they've been thrown back at us by their misuse. We will return and when we do, we will eliminate all of the individuals, items, and entities causing the problems. We will renew this world back to the state it was before mankind took place. The ones 
living in harmony and peace with each other and not killing or destroying will be allowed to stay with us on the planet, the ones causing all of the death, destruction, damage will be eliminated altogether. All of them, along with their things, will be completely removed from the face of this planet as we retake control of our world. They will vanish from Earth, each and every one of them, and their implements of destruction will go with them. Wow, why are you telling me this stuff? So it's not going to be a war like everybody thinks, is it? No, as war is how mankind solves its problems, we will simply eliminate all involved with the Earth's decay. They will completely be removed, disappear in a flash, a twinkling of an eye. They will be taken off this planet and the ones left transformed into what we are. We are you. Once again, why are you telling me this? What am I supposed to do about all the rotten people in the world? Warn them to change. Give them a chance to become part of the evolutionary process which will take place. Teach them that not sinning is not the way to enter our kingdom. They believe that going to church, saying a few prayers, then going Words in killing in war is still a safe path to transformation into endless life. Our Creator does offer endless life to those wishing to be part of it, putting others down because they are different, maybe not the same color or have different sexual preferences, is not one of the keys to the kingdom we speak of. Loving one another and accepting them for the way they are is love for one another isn't telling a person you don't agree with their lifestyle they're living. None of us are God, including us, as we're just as messengers. Let the Creator decide if someone isn't fit. It's not up to those people to drop bombs on other countries simply because they don't agree with the way they are living. We will help this planet get better when we see true unity between the inhabitants. Understand that there are many paths leading towards the same direction. Tell them to offer a life vest to their brothers and sisters, not a bomb to be dropped on someone worshiping our Creator in a different fashion as another. Our Creator has been around before this planet was in existence, and His ideas haven't changed just because some people wrote a book and they titled it a holy. The ancient kings fought wars believing they were doing it for God when He never wanted any of the wars or killing. So, what is it you want me to do about it all? How can I help you achieve what it is you want to achieve? I'm just a simple man, a woodworker, a cabinet maker with no pool or voice in this world. I'd like to help out, but I don't know what you want me to do. The man you call Jesus is a king in our kingdom, and he was a woodworker in this world like you. He was sent to show this world how to act and how to be, but was put to death for doing so. He lives with us now, and the people of Earth won't get another chance to kill him. He was transformed into his eternal body upon his physical death. He was sent to show the way in the people of your Earth. Once again, spin him back on us like all of the good things we tried to do for Earth's inhabitants in the past. 
hey, I wasn't part of that. I love Jesus and pray to him all the time. I'm sorry for what those people did to him. It was awful and inexcusable. I become sad every time I think of the way they treated him. It was just an awful thing to do to him. He came here to help us. We already know this about you and why you are part of us. You are chosen to be part of us during your conception and have remained with us ever since. You are the one to get this message out there and we know you're capable of doing it. We will help you as you go as we are part of your life. Your great never listen to me. If I mention you guys, I'll be a laughing stock, then they'll seriously not listen. So it's kind of useless mentioning you anyway, isn't it? Maybe right now, as the thing is not right yet, they will indeed laugh. Let their laughter build character, and we will train you as you go. At some point in the near future, this thing will be right at, and they will listen. Instantly, the room brightened up, making it impossible for me to see anything as my body grew warm again like hot flashes. As quickly as I warmed, I cooled back down and the lighting dimmed. Apparently, the aliens had transported me back to my car, and once again I was sitting in the driver's seat, fully clothed, with my hands on the steering wheel. Without doing a thing, the shift lever slid into park, the engine started back up, my headlights came back on as the cassette deck began playing again right where it left off with the band Toto. With the bright light still behind me, I heard the diesel sounding noise mixed with a high pitched winch as I felt my car lift off the ground, then move from the field back over to the shoulder of the road, then placed back down. The lights behind dim turning into what appeared as headlights, then suddenly their vehicle came around my driver's side and passed me heading up the freeway. It was obvious they wanted me to see who and what they were. It was the strangest vehicle I'd ever seen, and it hovered a foot or two off the ground while traveling north up the 101 freeway, just like a car would, but without wheels. It was all white, with a black stripe running the length, had no windows, it had orange running lights, and one bright headlight. It made a sound resembling a very fast, high-pitched revving motor. I placed my car into drive, then stepped on the gas trying to catch up as I wanted a better look. Even with my vehicle floored, the craft kept ahead gaining speed, moving further and further away by moment by moment. They were obviously toying with me, allowing me to see just enough to remember them by so I'd know the visit was real. I was about a mile before my exit when my work buddy Alex soared up beside me in his hot rod and began following the craft with me. We were side by side chasing the alien craft up the freeway. He glanced over at me with a puzzled look, pointed at it, then shrugged his shoulders. I simply shook my head from side to side and shrugged my shoulders, motioning that I didn't know what it was. The two of us followed it for a short distance further, then it shot out way ahead of us, losing us like a jet aircraft. Just before our exit, Alex pulled in front of me and I watched as the craft shot straight up into the sky and moments later it disappeared. I'd never seen any vehicle operate and move like it in my life and the scene was absolutely astounding. After reaching work, I pulled into the shop parking lot and I saw everybody already heading in. The five minute warning buzzer had just gone off. Apparently I must have lost 45 to 50 minutes because 
it was already time to go in and I should be 50 minutes early. I had to be there by 6 a.m. and I was leaving my house at 4.25 a.m. ever since I lost time during the Triangle Craft incident. Allowing for the five minute walk through the field and warming my car along with a 40 minute drive, I should have arrived at work by 5.10. The missing time caused bewilderment and seeing all my co-workers walking in after the five minute warning buzzer absolutely made me ponder what actually happened. I was confused by it all, so I panicked and quickly jumped out of my car, then walked in with everybody else like nothing happened at all. Alex saw me on the way in and asked, what was that thing on the freeway, Mike? Shaking my head in wonder and throwing my hands in the air, I replied, I don't know, you saw what I saw. Mimicking my, emo my emotions and shaking his head from side to side, he said, that thing was weird, whatever it was. Another coworker named Rip, Rick, who'd been standing close by and listening in on the conversation, decided to chime in and asked, hey Mike, why was your car parked in the middle of that field? I stopped to see if you needed help, but you were nowhere around either, where were you? I was shocked that somebody else had seen my car in the field and really didn't know how to respond. Not having a rational explanation, I lied then replied, the strangest thing happened, I was run off the road by this tow truck that came out of nowhere turning in my lane. I noticed by his expression he wasn't falling for it, but I went on with my story anyway and continued, yeah, then the guy wound up being really nice and he felt so bad about running me off the road that he decided to help tow me out for free. I figured because my car was okay, I'd just let the whole thing go. He was really cool, towed me out back on the road and we just said later. His look of astonishment and disbelief was priceless. I kept a straight face the entire time as the truth would have been worse. Rick started laughing hysterically then said, Hey Mike, I didn't see any tow truck and I didn't see you. All I saw was your car in the middle of the field. Just then the final work buzzer went off and it was time to punch in. So he said, maybe later you can fill me in with the truth. Punching his time card, he added, I'm still wondering how you got your car out into the middle of the field in the first place. Now you're telling me about a tow truck that wasn't there either. Letting out a sigh and still shaking his head from side to side in absolute disbelief, he said, What's even weirder is the fact you weren't anywhere around. I stopped to see if you needed help, but you weren't there. You weren't south or north walking along the freeway either, and there's nothing for miles. I walked out to your car into that field to see if you were alright, thinking maybe something happened to you inside, and the windows were rolled up, doors locked, with your keys still in the ignition. It was the strangest thing. Where were you? he asked. Being totally bewildered and not knowing what to say, I replied, I'm telling you guys, the car just sort of slid out there when the tow truck ran me off the road. Realizing how stupid my story was beginning to sound and trying to avoid any further questions, I quickly said, hey, we'd better get to work. Good idea, said Alex, heading for a station. It looks like I better watch out for those tow trucks, Mike. I knew they figured I was full of bull, but I really didn't know what else to say. Seriously, what was I going to do? blurt out that I was just abducted by aliens.